As we continue to study into the book of Genesis, we're in Genesis chapter 26. Uh, Genesis chapter 26, last week we were studying with uh, Pastor John about the, uh, the main focus was the coming of right between uh, Jacob and Esau, right? And so now on chapter 26, uh, the, the focus goes to, to Isaac in a very interesting way. And so if you want to join me, please. Uh, Genesis chapter 26. Amen. And it says, There was famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. So what was there? There was what? Famine. There was a famine. Now, what, what do, uh, when you study the Bible, what does famine represent? Let's see. What does famine represent in Scripture? Lack of food. Right? Lack of bread, lack of water, right? Do those have spiritual uh, connotations, right? Bread, the Word of God, water, the, the Holy Spirit, right? So we see that there was famine in the land. And it mentions also that the same situation happened to who? It happened to Abraham, right? It happened to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. And what did Abraham do when the famine came? Who remembers what did he do? He moved. Where did he go to? He went to Egypt. Very good. He went to Egypt. Now, and notice it says here that Isaac didn't go to Egypt. And the question then is why? Why didn't he go to Egypt? We're going to see that he intended to go to Egypt too, as his father did when the famine came. Why Egypt? Specifically during this time frame. Why Egypt? They had food, right? They, they were flourishing. It's not like this, I guess we can say maybe because of some type of... Uh, adaptive climate change in the situations that have in some of Egypt, right? We see, we usually see images of Egypt and it's very dry, but it was fertile, very fertile during these times. And so that's why it was a, it was a hotbed. The big river came up from Africa to Egypt. Exactly, right? So we're going to see in a second why Isaac, he was planning to go to Egypt, but he didn't go to Egypt when the famine came. Now it also mentions Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, right? Now, didn't Abimelech, king of the Philistines, also show up in the story of Abraham? Yes, it did, right? But uh, it's believed that this is not the same Abimelech. And there's a number of reasons why, even though it has, he has the same name as the same uh, Abimelech, the king of the Philistines during the times of Abraham, it's believed that it's not the same king. And there's a number of reasons. First of all, uh, when Abraham was with Abimelech, that was pre-Isaac, right? How old was Abraham when he had Isaac? He was a hundred. He was a hundred, remember? He was a hundred when he had Isaac. And so this is pre, the, the Abimelech that we see with Abraham was pre-Isaac. And the other reason, how old was Abraham when he had Isaac? He was a hundred, right? Now, in the previous chapter we had studied, Abraham had died. How old was Abraham when he died? He was 175. So how old was Isaac? He was 75, right? So if this happened... Oh, maybe almost a hundred years. We're talking about the, the episode of Abraham when he was with King Abimelech. But now we see Abraham, we see Isaac, his son, 70, almost over 75 years later, he's also then uh, has interaction with Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. So what does this tell us? It's most likely, very unlikely, that that's not the same king, right? And so what we see is when you study this topic of, the, of Abimelech, what you see is that historians believe that it was a title, right? Abimelech was more like the title of the kings of the Philistines, kind of like they would say to this emperor, what was the emperor of Rome called in certain time frame? Caesar, right? And Caesar's a common name. So it's understood that Abimelech was the name of, uh, it was the title of the king of the Philistines that was given. So maybe Abimelech one, Abimelech two, right? So that's when we study in the name because you think about, it, wait a minute, how old? He, if, he was, if he was still king around that time, then he would be very, very old, right? So that, that's some, some interesting notes. Now, the question I asked was, why didn't Isaac go down to Egypt? Look at what it says in verse number two. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, do not, what? Do not go down to Egypt. So I have a question. Was Isaac intended on going to Egypt? Yes, he intended to go. But God said what? Don't go, don't go to Egypt. And now the question is, why didn't God want Isaac to go to Egypt? Let's continue to read. Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell where? Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants, I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your 
father. So, eight, so God tells him not to go down. Why? He says, I want you to stay here. I want you, we can say, kind of see it this way, I want you to set, set in some, some roots, right? Because this is the land that I have promised your father. This is the land that I have promised you too. Now, what we see also in this, in this context is that we see the character of Isaac. God told him, don't go. Did he go? No, he didn't, right? You know, this is the first instance in the Bible where we see God directly speak to Isaac. It doesn't mean maybe he didn't speak to him before, but this is recorded in the Bible is the first time that God directly speaks to, he speaks to Isaac, right? Now, did he speak directly to his father? Yes. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a God of what? A God that wants to what? That wants to be involved. A God that wants to have a personal relationship with his children, amen? He directly told him, I don't want you to go down. I don't want you to go down to Egypt. Everybody with me? And then he tells him the reason, right? He's telling him because this is, the, this is the land. This is the covenant that I made with your father. I'm making the same covenant with you, amen? He's repeating, right? He's reaffirming that covenant and he's saying, now this covenant is going to be fulfilled through you. Look at what it says in verse number four. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven and I will give, you, I will give to your descendants all these lands, and here's the, the beautiful part, and in your what? In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. blessed. Yes. Oh, well, now you were talking about um, there being two um, Abimelech. Abimelechs, but it says, which I swore to Abraham your father. So he's talking as though he was back there well, he was with Abraham when he gave him that promise. And now he's telling that same promise that I gave to your father, this same lamb that I'm promising to you. So what the, the issue of whether it's the same Abimelech based on time frames, it's very unlikely. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's very, very unlikely that it's the same king, that it was more of a title based on what historians, what historians say about this, this king of the Philistines. So what we're seeing is God is repeating the same promise to, to who? Isaac. To Isaac, right? The promise of what? What was the two things that God promised Isaac, uh, a Abraham and now Isaac? Land. land and descendants, right? But the land and the descendants were going to be through who? Through the seed. Amen? Yeah. Remember, the promises were going to come through the seed. And some people focus on the literal promise, the literal land and the literal descendants. But we know that the real promise, right? It was a spiritual promise. And that promise was going to be fulfilled, not literally through Abraham in the sense of those that came out of him, but from who? Through the seed that was going to come. And everybody then that joined to the seed would then be partakers of the promise of what? Of the descendants, right? The great multitude that is going to be saved, the family that is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. And what land are we talking about is the promise. It's not that little piece of real estate over there in the Middle East. What's the true land that God promised through the seed? It was the new heavens and the new earth, amen? A new heavens and the new earth, the promise where there would be righteousness, no more pain, no more suffering. That was the great promise. And if you remember when we talked about uh, previously Genesis, when we go into Hebrews 11, it says Moses and Abraham and Sarah, they never were expecting a literal kingdom to be fulfilled in their times or down. They were expecting what? A heavenly city, right? They were expecting the new Jerusalem and that was the promise. So what God is telling here, Isaac, is once again, you are going to be what? You are going to be a father to that seed, right? Now, how many of you have children here? How many of you have children? Imagine if God would have told you, your son is going to be the savior of the world. What would you have thought? What a great privilege, right? So I'm, I'm sure that that's how Abraham and now Isaac is feeling. Wow, my son, my child, the one that is going to come from me is going to be the savior of the world. Can you imagine the great privilege and honor, right? Now it's a little difficult for us to understand because we usually don't see farther farther down our great our grandchildren maybe great grandchildren right but here they're looking at you know the line the name again all the descendants that would would come down it was a great honor for them to know my son the one that was going to come from my lineage was going to be the savior of the world and so it's a it's a great uh, blessing that God is bestowing upon them telling him what exactly is going to happen amen so look at what it says in verse number in verse number five and it says, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now I have a question. The promise that God gave, the covenant that God gave Abraham and Isaac, was it conditional or unconditional? It was a conditional 
covenant. And the covenant was conditional on what? On obedience. Amen? It was obedience. So God is telling Isaac, because your father Abraham obeyed me, he's saying, if you choose to obey me, what? I am going to fulfill this promise through you too. Amen? And so it's showing us how obedience is a, is a, is a condition of covenant. Every covenant that you find in the Bible, there are always conditions to the covenant. Amen? I have a question. Because we are in the new covenant, does that mean that obedience is somehow not important anymore? No, right? We know that that's cheap grace, right? We know that obedience is still the condition. The only difference in the old covenant is that the old covenant was based on the Ten Commandments written in stone and the ceremonial laws, right? The laws that had to do with sacrifices and all the things that were happening in the earthly sanctuary. But in the new covenant, we see in the book of Hebrews, it says, for example, that the new covenant is based on what? Now the Ten Commandments are written on our hearts, right? The principles of God's government are written on our hearts. And now it's not based on the blood of lambs and sacrifices of animals, but now it's based on the blood and on, the, and on who? On the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the new covenant. So nothing really changes. And we see this dynamic through a number of different places. Uh, go with me to Genesis chapter 17. I love this phrase. Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Verse number one. Look at how God confirming what, he, what he's telling Isaac. He told Abraham. Genesis 17, 1. Everybody there? It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am Almighty, the Almighty God. What does he tell him? Walk before me and be what? Blameless, right? That, fra that, phrase, that phrase is be just, be perfect. And look at what he says. And if you do that, if you walk in front of me and if you obey me, if you honor me, if you respect me, he says what? I will make my covenant between you and me and you and you will multiply and I will multiply you what? exceedingly right so once again we're seeing that Abraham it was based on what based on faith that Abraham obeyed God amen it was based on on knowing God and if we go to Genesis chapter 15 watch this Genesis chapter 15 in verse number 6 Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 this is a fascinating fascinating verse and it says in verse number 6 and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness in the Spanish it's a little bit more specific because here it says he believed in the Lord in Spanish it says he believed the Lord what does that imply it implies that Abraham had a personal relationship with God amen Abraham had a personal walk with God he didn't believe of he didn't hear of who God was he knew God personally and then out of that intimate relationship that Abraham had with God he knew who God was and that led him to what to believe in God remember when God told him to leave his land, he didn't tell him where he was going, right? He said, just leave. And Abraham, out of faith, what does it say? It says in Hebrews chapter 11, which is a fascinating verse, it says, because of Abraham's obedience, right? It, it was counted as what? As righteousness, not to obtain righteousness, but because he was obeying God and because it was out of faith, it was counted as what? It was counted as a right, he was counted as a righteous man, amen? And so that's why when we see in the new covenant, the law is written in the hearts. So a lot of people sometimes, you know, well, what does that mean? It's because now our obedience to God, now the things that we do, we keep the commandments, we come to church, we read our Bible. The things that we do is not to obtain uh, forgiveness or it's not to obtain salvation. It's because we have obtained forgiveness and we have obtained salvation through Christ and it is the result of our salvation. Amen. So how we obey God is the result. We do it out of love, out of gratitude, out of confidence in the things that he has done for us. We say, thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gift of forgiveness through your son, Jesus Christ. And that leads us into obedience. Amen. Recently, I, I, was, doing, I was doing some visits uh, a couple of weeks ago when I went to this house of this gentleman. And, and, you know, we got into a conversation and he actually knew about Amazing Facts. He knew about Pastor Doug. And he said, you know, we were Seventh-day Adventists. And he says, oh, so he asked me a question. He says, how are we saved? Right? And he said, and I said, well, we're saved through grace, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? And I was going to continue. He says, ah, there you go. You were going to continue. That's all that saves us. It's our faith in Jesus Christ. I says, amen. And then I asked him the question, and how do you show your faith? How do you prove? What is, how, how is it that faith manifested? How is it demonstrated, right? It's demonstrated through what? Through obedience, right? Through our works. It says in James, in the book of James, right? He says, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith through my works, amen? So 
it, so when it gets tricky when people, you know, they, they kind of want to corner us in because he was expecting me to say that, oh, you're saved by obedience to the law. I said, no, you're saved through, gra- through faith in the grace and the love of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, amen? But that is manifested through my obedience to him, amen? To my submission to him, to my following him. Why? Because he is not only my savior, he is my Lord. And sometimes we forget about the word Lord, but Lord implies what? My king, my owner, right? My boss. You're going to say something, brother? Oh yeah, John chapter fourteen, That's verse fifteen. For keeping the Ten Commandments. It's I think we have a tendency to, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna obey them to the letter of the law, and you won't get there. Yeah, well, not if, not if, not if it's you're trying to obtain something, right? Yeah. Because then that's legalism. But when it's the results of it, so I, I, the way I like to frame it, sometimes it's easy. I said, faith is the root of salvation, and works are the fruits of salvation, right? right. So they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other, right? You can't have one, the uh, faith, grace, without the law, without the righteousness, and throughout the works that are a reflection or the results of the love that God has showed for us. Well, how could we not follow our God, right? How could we not trust in Him after He's done everything for us? So uh, just powerful, powerful. And we see also in Genesis chapter 5, uh, this Genesis 5, 26, 26 verse 5 is also a powerful testimony to sometimes people say, oh, the law showed up in Mount Sinai. And it says very clearly here that Abraham was doing what? He was obeying God's law, right? He was obeying the commandments, right? And of course, they, the, even the ceremonial laws hadn't been instituted per se in the book as it was written during the times of Moses. But we know that already God had spoken to him about the principles of the sacrificial system that were a reflection or that were a, 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 a figure or a shadow that would point to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, amen? So the principles are here, right? We know them and this is a, a big account. So let's go to uh, verse number six. Verse number six. We're in Genesis 26. Genesis 26, verse number 6. Amen? And it says, So Isaac dwelt where? In Gerar. Now why? Question. Let's have a quiz. Why did Isaac dwell in Gerar? Because God told him to. Amen? Because God told him. Where did he want to go? He wanted to go to Egypt. God said, Nuh-uh. Don't, don't follow what your father did. I want you to do something different this time. Although he did, a- a- Abraham eventually did also go to, to Gerar, right? In that context. So, uh, Let's, re- let's read verse number 7. And the men of the place asked about his wife. And he said, she is my sister, for he was afraid to say, she is my wife, because he thought, lest the man of the place kill me for Rebecca, because she is beautiful to, she is beautiful to behold. Once again, what are we seeing here? He's following in the footsteps of Abraham, right? <laughs> Right? We see the same patterns repeat despite the great manifestation of faith that Isaac had in God where he was probably saying, why would I stay in Gerar? I mean, Egypt is much more plentiful than Gerar. But he said, but God told me to. But then we always, we always see a slip up, right? This is one of the very few slip ups that we find with Isaac in the sense of that he followed in the same footsteps of his dad when we, it happened in Genesis chapter 12 in the, in the context of, of Egypt, right? And so how do we, how do we know and how do we Uh, how do we what would be the word how can we understand this it goes back to those hereditary I think I said that in in English right hereditarios how do you say it in English hereditary Hereditary weaknesses of the flesh right that 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 seems like from generation to generation despite the great faith that Abraham had and Isaac is showing great faith too in the Bible we still see the weaknesses right what does that tell us when we still see the flesh every once in a while come up when we still see the weaknesses of the flesh What does that let us know? We need to spend more time with Christ, right? That means we need to cling more to God. We need to spend more time in praying. We need to spend more time with the word. We need to spend more time with him so he can reflect more on us, right? So we can continue to be transformed, right? So it's still, we see the process of sanctification despite great faith. Sometimes people get complacent when they have great victories in faith. But it tells us what? We need to stay what? We need to say, we need to get stronger and stronger and stronger because as soon as we, as we lack off or as soon as we are a little bit careless with our daily devotionals, what happened? Oh, the flesh pops up like that, right? Woo! Immediately, and it's like once again, 
getting back on that, on, that, uh, on that bicycle, right? So we're seeing these missteps. And of course, right, again, Rebecca, he's not, she's not her, his sister, right? She's uh, based on the lineages, she's, her, she's Isaac's second cousin, right? But they're related, right? They're family. It's talking about, once again, uh, the lineage. Let's continue to read uh, verse number eight. Now it came to pass when, when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously she is your wife, so how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, lest I die on, lest I die on account of her. Now I have a question. Do you think Isaac knew the story of his father? right? Do you think Abimelech, let's say this is not the same Abimelech, which is most likely, let's say he was the son or the descendant of, do you think he knew the same story about Abraham, right? So we're seeing the same thing, it's like, really again? That's exactly what happened with your dad. And like, yeah, with you too, right? We're seeing the, the, the same patterns repeat, and we're going to see why exactly as we go on with the, with the study, these patterns continue to repeat. So we're on verse number, uh, verse number 10, um, 9, right? Nine. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously she is your wife, so how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die, what? Lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought what? Guilt on us. I have a question. Did King Abimelech, did these people know the God of Isaac? Yes, right? Because he knew, as it happened with Abraham, right? He's saying, if any of us would have taken your wife and we would have slept with her, with her, what would have happened? We would have been cursed. What happened to the king of, to the Pharaoh when he took, uh, uh, when he wanted to take uh, Abraham's wife? What fell on him? Plagues, right? It says plagues. Notice this. A pagan king wants to take the bride of the seed and what happens? a death penalty is placed on them, right? In the context of Abraham, the plagues were fallen on. Are, are you seeing the prophetic implications? God's people were in Egypt and God did what? The Pharaoh did not want to leave God's bride low. What did he do? He sends plagues. When you look in Revelation, same, same pattern, right? God's people, God's bride or what? Babylon is persecuting her, right? He's holding her down, not letting her want to worship her husband as he deserves. And what does God do in Revelation 17? 16, I'm sorry, he sends plagues. plagues. You see the patterns, right? These patterns, we find them throughout the Bible. They're fascinating, they're repetitive, and they show us uh, the greater story of what we're seeing in this context. So God sends a death decree to anyone who touches the bride of the seed. Amen? And that's, that's the prophetic implications of what we're looking at as we, as we study through here. Let's go to verse number 12. Verse number 12, it says, Then Isaac showed, sowed in the land and reaped in the same year, how much? A hundredfold, and the Lord did what? So Isaac, he establishes himself in the land that God had promised, and he started to what? He started to work the land. And did, did he reap the benefits? How much? a hundredfold or a hundred to one. Now that's a great investment plan, I mean. And it says in, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 23, that at the best, best, re, the best results of, of your working the land would be 30 to 50 by one. But Isaac here got how much? A hundredfold, amen. What are we seeing here? What is God trying to show us here? The blessings, right? The abundant not just any blessings, abundant blessings. Isaac was abundantly blessed. I have a question for you. Why was Isaac abundantly blessed? Because of what? Obedience. Because of his obedience, amen? And his obedience came through faith, amen? So it is through his faith, his knowledge, his personal relationship. He trusted God. He stayed in that land, despite it not probably being the le best land and real estate in that, of that time frame. But he trusted God and he says, God, the blessings come through you, not through the land. Amen? And it says he was abundantly blessed so much. What does it say in verse number 13? The man began to prosper and continue prospering until he became very prosperous. How many times does it say the word prosper? 
Three times, right? Prospered, prospered, prospered. I have a question for you. Was he blessed abundantly, yes or no? Oh, he became exceedingly and abundantly rich through this, amen? So God blessed him. And it's predicated on a lack of confidence in God in the first place. Yep. Because somebody's gonna get it. That's right. And what we're seeing is... God overlooked that, I guess. Well, and, and what we're gonna see too in a second is that God blesses him so much that others that do not believe think that the blessing is because of the land. Not understanding that the blessing isn't from because of the land or because of the resources or because of what's found there, but the blessing is because of the God that I, Isaac is serving, amen? So that's the focus, right? Sometimes we, we focus on, oh, this piece of real estate or that piece of real estate or, or a lot of things. The most important thing for every decision that we make in our lives is that we have God's blessings because we know that if we have God's blessings, then all things shall be done according to his goodwill, amen? And we shall be blessed. And that's what one of the many, many lessons that we find in this, in this one chapter that we're studying. Let's go to verse number uh, 14. Now here comes the issue, right? We have the abundant blessing and now comes the problem. Verse number 14 and it says, For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. And so what happened? So the Philistines started to what? Envy to envy him. Why did they start to envy him? Because he was getting blessed, right? Abundantly, exceedingly blessed. And so they were looking at it and say, What? Oh, look at this guy. He takes this land, he comes into our neighborhood, and he comes up and look at what he does. He gets even more blessed than we are, so they, they envied him. Verse number 15, and it says, Now the Philistines had stopped, had stooped, I'm sorry, up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. I have a question, did this same problem happen to Abraham? Yes, right? It says here that during the times of Abraham, he also, Abraham did what? He built wells, and what did the Philistines do out of envy? Same thing. They clogged them up, right? They clogged them up in the same way. Look at what it says in verse number 16. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Notice, they weren't afraid of him when he got there, but now what? Now they're terrified because now they're seeing how prosperous he's getting, how big his flocks are getting, how abundant his blessings are. I'm sorry, the number of servants. And they're remembering Abraham, right? And they're saying, oh, we know Abraham. He was one to reckon with, right? So they were saying, this is the same thing that is happening with Isaac. We're seeing these patterns repeat itself, right? We're seeing the same issues. Now, notice, this is very interesting. What does water represent? Symbolically, what does water represent? The Holy Spirit, right? So we're seeing, we're seeing here, God's son is getting what? He's getting blessed. Why? Because of his obedience. The power of the Holy Spirit is being manifested in his life. And what happens when the power of the Holy Spirit is starting to grow and manifest in our lives? We are get abundantly blessed. And then those that don't have it become what? Envious. And what do they do? They want to end our party, right? They want to end those blessings by what? By coming in and trying to what? Take those things that God gave us, right? It's, it's, I remember this story in, in, in the same way of Simon the Magician. Remember Simon the, magi the Magician? We're going to see this all, also. Uh, Simon the Magician, what happened? He saw the power that the disciples were having and what did he say? He said, I want that. He thought he could buy it. Not knowing that it was what? That the blessings and the power of the Holy Spirit manifested in the life of God's people are not, can, you can't buy it. It's through what? It's through faith, right? It's through the blessings. So let's go to verse number 17. Watch as how, how this story continues to develop. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of where? In the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So did Isaac put up a fight? When they told him, you know, you're getting too blessed, you're getting too big, you're getting too power. Did Isaac put up a fight? No. no. What did he do? He left, right? He left. He just left. And look at what it says in verse 18. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But, verse number 20, the herdmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdmen saying, the water is, who does the, what does water represent? The Holy Spirit. The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek because they quarreled with him. 
What happened next? Verse 21. Then they dug a, another well. And so they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Re. How do we say that? Rehoboth. Rehoboth. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. So he continues, anywhere he's going, you see, they continue to think that the blessing is because, oh, he has this piece of property, right? Not knowing that the blessing came from who? From God. And God continued to bless him, right? Once again, that water, a representation of what? Of the blessings of God through the Holy Spirit, of the abundance that Isaac was living. And we're seeing that, he says, so they come in and they say, what? No, you can't do this. So what does he do? Isaac says, okay. Because Isaac knows one thing. He says, the blessing doesn't come from the land. The blessing comes from? So he goes, I'm going to move someplace else. I'm still going to be blessed. And I bet you they weren't as blessed because why? Because they kept on thinking. They kept on focusing on the earthly things while Isaac has his eyes on the heavenly things, right? On the heavenly blessings. And so he continues, he says, wherever I go, as long as the Lord is guiding me and I'm following his will, I will be blessed, amen? I and my family and everything that I possess. And it says, in verse number uh, 23, then he went up from there to where? To Beersheba, right? Beersheba then is the same place. Didn't we see Beersheba already? With who? With Abraham. It's the same place also that Abraham had been what? Same pattern, right? Building wells and they kept on trying to impede it and so he just continued to move. You know, I see something interesting in this story also is that if you notice as he was moving, he was moving further and further away from the city, Isaac, right? Does that tell us anything, right? It's God's message, right? He was moving every time he would move further and further away. The closer he was to the city, the blessings would become what? They would become uh, envy to those around him. So he had to get out of the city, right? And he had to get out of the city until finally he got farthest away from the city while still being on the land to where what? To where then God was a blessing, amen? So remember, it doesn't mean that we're also, you know, just carry out our things. If you have the power and the resources to live outside of the city and work in the city, praise the Lord, amen? amen. Right? It's a blessing, right? It's a great blessing. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm live my, half my life in New York City and I would, I would never raise children in New York City. Whew. I would never do it. You, what I would like, I was up at Weimar this last weekend and that was just beautiful up there. I'd never been up there. Really nice. I said, this is a place, right? Have a nice cottage, raise your children, right? But then, right, go back into the city and do the work, right? Do the door to door, do the working that we have to do in the city that we're called to do. So I, I kind of see this message uh, uh, overlapping, right? About how God is also asking his children uh, to, to follow in that way. So we see that the blessing is not based on the real estate. The blessing is not based on the resources. The blessing is not based on the things that can come out of the land, but the blessing comes through who? Through God, right? That was the blessing that Isaac had is because Isaac was following God. He was following his words. And so we too are to be a blessing to others, amen? We too also, as God blesses us, people are gonna see that blessing in one. They're either gonna say, wow, how blessed you are. And through our faith, they're gonna want to receive that blessing or they're gonna what? They're probably gonna elbows and say oh no I, 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 y that's not fair right that's not fair what are you going to say brother well what you just said is in 24 yes yes I, I just I, I, I lead up right I intro and then I lead up uh, into this so we are to be a blessing to others and also a witness amen what does this tell me? This, the wells, the water, everywhere Isaac went, there were more wells. He was building the wells, the water, the Holy Spirit. This is telling us about the witness of Isaac to those in that land. The witness was what? I serve a mighty God, right? And because I serve a mighty God, he blesses me. In this context, it's land, but there can be so much blessings, health blessings, right? Happiness, joy blessings. And that is supposed to be our witness to the world as it was to Isaac of the time of those people. I'm sure that many, many Philistines would know through the story of Abraham, know now the story of Isaac. They were saying, these, these men are blessed and their families are blessed. Why? Because they serve the Lord. And I'm sure that when we're in heaven, right, and, when, and during the millennium, we're gonna know a lot of people, that, a lot of Philistines that came to the Lord of Israel through what? Through the witness and testimony of Abraham and Isaac as they saw that God is truly blessing his people and we wanna get to know that God, amen? And so these are just little, uh, like behind the curtain stories that we find uh, as we go through uh, the wonderful story of, uh, of, of Isaac and of Abraham, amen? Let's go to verse number 24. 
And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. Now, question. Why do you think God is repeating the same promise to Isaac? He already said it at the beginning of the chapter in verse number 2. Why do you think God is repeating it to Isaac in verse number 20, 24? Does anybody have an idea? Why do you think God is repeating it to Isaac? Why do you think, brother? Uh-huh. Okay. That's a that's that's down the line. Chapter 22 verse 16, uh-huh. I'm just repeating the verses so those that are cuz they can't hear you online. That's okay. Yep. Okay. All right. What do you think? Amen. You know why I think uh, he repeated it when he had already said it in verse number two? Or oh, you wanted to say something? Well, Go ahead. Yeah, God's just demonstrating his faithfulness to his servant Isaac uh, with the conditional promises that he made to him earlier in the chapter. Amen. So yes. So again, God, he's reforcing, right, what he's saying. And I think also that I think Isaac was maybe frustrated, right? Despite his faith, doesn't that happen sometimes? We're faithful to the Lord, and, but still the, 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 the burdens of life, sometimes they still, they get, I think he was frustrated. I got to move again. He, he, notice his character. He never put up a fight, right? He just says, all right. He just followed away and he moved, right? And he moved away knowing and understanding that he, he never seeked revenge. And yet despite that, I see it as God repeated it to him again because I think Isaac was probably tired. Oh, Lord. Again, I have to move it. And God said, remember this. The promise is through you because of Abraham. Amen? And if you remain faithful to Abraham, I know that it's going to be a burden. I know that sometimes being faithful is difficult, right? Because other people, they take their swings at you. Other people might elbow you. Other people are uncomfortable when they see the blessings I'm giving you. But understand this, my son. I'm with you and I will fulfill your promise, right? So I see it as, as encouragement, as the brother said, right? And I see it as God repeating because I think maybe Isaac was, was a little getting, you know, has, has anybody moved around a lot? You know, people that are in military families, they move around. I mean, I haven't, I've moved around quite often. I've lived in five different states. And, and, but it can, get, it can get difficult, right? So I, I'm, I'm seeing as Abraham and God is reinforcing that faith, right? God is reinforcing that faith to Isaac as, as he continues to, to, and as he shows up now in the land of Beersheba. Um, verse number 24, amen? It says, And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. We just read that. Uh, I will bless you. Verse 25, so notice this. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a what? dug a well so I love this what let's see what is when you see that God what when God's children they build an altar in a specific place where there's a where there's a, an event what what does this altar represent what does this altar represent what is the altar it happens a number of times right Noah did it after he got out of the ark Abraham did it it's consistently throughout especially the Hebrew scriptures we see that every time God would do something powerful his, his children would build an an altar. Why? Why an altar? All right. To remember the promise, right? Because the altar was, they would sacrifice on the altars, right? I think it was also a testimony to those in that land, right? Because when you see when, when, when God's people, you know, out of all the situations through thousands of years, they're just basically going around in the same piece of land, right? 
Not even, I'm not just talking about the 40 years in the desert. I'm talking about God's people. They keep coming around and what happens? Every time they would come around, I'm sure they would hear the stories of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And when they would go around, they would see, oh, look, that's the altar that was built for X reason. Or that's the altar that was built for that reason, right? They're like markers that God leaves in, in, the, land of, uh, in the promised land to show them what? I've kept my promises. Look at the faith that my, yeah, your forefathers have shown me and I have stayed with them and I was faithful to them, amen? Does God leave those same altars in our life, right? Testimonies, powerful testimonies of how God has worked in our life, right? We can go back. I don't know about you, but I have a notebook and I like to write. Every time God does just something just blows me away, I like to write it in my notebook. I have a prayer notebook and a, and a, and a, where I put my prayers and I, I like to uh, memorize Bible verses. And in the back part of every notebook, I write, I write all the powerful things that God has worked in my life. And guess what? When, I'm, when sometimes my, my faith is lacking, right? Sometimes I'm, I have a down day and I'm like, oh, or, or something comes into my life, a burden, right? That I say, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it. Guess what the Holy Spirit says? Go back to the list. Go back to the altar, and when I go and look at my list, I said, whoo, I thought the same thing here and look at how wonderful he worked. I thought the same thing here and look at how wonderful he worked. I thought the same thing here and look at how God worked in my life and he walked me through those problems, amen? Those are those altars, right? Those, those moments in our, in our Christian walk where God has established and he showed us in powerful ways, look at what I've done to you in the past. Keep on walking with faith, amen? That's why I love Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will what? I will strengthen you. I will always help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. It's by holding on to those promises, right? And seeing, not just knowing the promise, but seeing the actual promise fulfilled in our Christian walk, that gives us what? Those are those altars of remembrance that God leaves in our lives so we can look at them and say, God has walked me through these difficult times before, but look at there. God has been faithful to his people, amen? God has walked us through these times, and so those are, that's what I see when I see these altars being placed up and, and, and they continue to come around. It. I have a question. Are there still places in the Middle East, in, the, in this area, where people can say, oh, this is where this happened, right? This is where this happened, right? right? Because God has left evidences, remnants, right? Of the things that he has done in the past, we can still come to see it despite we knowing that now, uh, God's people are everyone that has accepted Jesus Christ, not literally this piece of land or real estate in, in, a, in a specific place. You were going to say something, brother. Amen. Amen. To those that obey him and honor him. Amen. Where? I didn't hear the, the name of the book. Oh, John. John the Third book of John, the epistle. Okay. The foreigners, exactly. Yes. Amen. Amen, especially, and when we look at the, you mentioned the Ten Commandments, obeying the Ten Commandments, I look at the commandments that they're actually as promises, right? 
their promises. They're saying, God says, I'm going to give you the power so you don't have to lie. I'm going to give you the power so you can be faithful in your marriage. I'm going to give you the power so that you don't have to be idolatrous. I'm going to give you the power so that you can keep my Sabbaths, right? They're promises that God has established with his people showing us, he's saying, I'm telling you to do these things, but I'm going to give you the power to do these things, right? The verse that you mentioned, uh, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Implying that it is a reflection of those that love him and implying that, Keep my commandments. I'm going to give you the power to keep it. If you love me, I'm going to strengthen you so that you can be faithful and not just faithful in a, in a vacuum, but I want to bless you through the, your obedience so that you can be a blessing to others. So that others, the foreigners, right? The Gentiles, the non-believers can see what I'm doing with you, through you, in you. I want to do it with them too. And the, that light, right? It says in Isaiah, your light will shine. The glory of God will be shined through you, through your life, through your, your attitude, through your character. And people will come because they want to know the God that you serve. Amen? And so these are just uh, 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 all these, I mean, sometimes we look at a chapter and it, looks, it seems so simple. And yet when you go inside of it, right, you can extract all of these wonderful, all of these wonderful lessons, right, that we find out of it. Let's go to verse number uh, 26. Genesis 26, 26. Now, here, here, here's another twist. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Hauzuach, one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to him, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? So Isaac goes to Beersheba, and guess what happens? He's abundantly blessed. And now what happens? Guess who shows up? Right? Abimelech suing for peace. Yeah. Why now? Oh. Once again, as Isaac went farther and farther away from him, what happened? Also the blessings, right? Because those that are around God's children, they also receive blessings. So he's saying, I'm sure that the time frame of when Isaac left, Abimelech said, wait a minute. We're, we're having difficulties again. I think we should, we should make peace with, peace with Isaac. Why? Because Isaac's God has blessed him and we don't want to be. We kicked him out and it, things aren't going too well. So I'm, I'm sure something would have hap- must have happened that they said, it's probably because we kicked Isaac out, right? It's probably because we sent him further away. And so now Abimelech is probably saying what? Uh, can, 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 can we be friends again, right? Can we be friends? Things weren't going too well. We were going fine when you were here, but now you, we kicked you out and I think God is punishing us. That's, what, that's the mindset that I'm thinking of, right? In this context. Look at what it says in verse number uh, 28. Or you might get cursed. Yeah, right? But they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. He had him there for a long time, right? And he never did follow up with the covenant that Abimelech with Abraham. Now he's saying what? You know, we notice that your God blesses you and he blessed, he blessed us just because you were close to us and because we were treating you. And because of the way we mistreated you, we feel that your God is not. So we want to get into a covenant with you. We want to make sure that that God of yours, he continues to bless us too because things aren't going too well. Are you seeing the scenery, right? It's kind of developing. It doesn't say it there explicitly, but it is kind of, it's, it's inferred, right? In the text. You wanted to say something, brother? Well, you know, when you think of where they're at, and the water is a big issue for them, no matter where they go, everywhere they dig, there's water. Well, that gets, that gets old after a while to the guys that dig and there's no water. Yep. And I think that's maybe one of the big things. Is everywhere these people go, they just thrive. Yep. And it's not water. Yep. God says, dig here. And so what they're, they're not really wanting to know God. They're just wanting the blessings that come of ha- ha- knowing God, right? And does that happen in the Christian walk too? Do we have a lot of Christians that they come to church either most sometimes by the fear because of, you know, the concept of hell. But a lot of people come, they, they think this is like a, a jackpot, right? Oh, if I come and I, and I serve this God, I'm going to be blessed. Now knowing that that's, if that's what you're coming for, you're coming for all the wrong reasons. Because the Bible says it's that those blessings come from a, a appreciative humble contrite heart that says lord thank you for what you have done for me lord and it, out of that when we surrender our lives to god then god says how am i not going to bless you when you have recognized the things that i have done for you when you have given me my place when you have honored me god does what 
He throws, he bestows the blessings. I think it's in, in Malachi, right? Chapter, chapter 3, it says that God is, is waiting to open the windows, the blessings and the windows of heaven to pour down his blessings on every single human being. Why is it, why, what reason doesn't that not happen? Because, because of our lack of faith, right? Because we're doing things for the wrong reasons, because we're expecting, right? We're doing things because we have an interest in serving this God because He is going to bless us, not serving Him because He is our blessing, amen? Because He is the purpose of the blessing. And so what we see here is maybe, let's, 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 let's not, uh, let's say this maybe, I'm sure that maybe as, after Isaac left, maybe those wells weren't giving that much water anymore, right? And so they were like, ooh, Right, as you mentioned. So, so all of these little, these little intricacies, what we see uh, overall is that, that God blesses his children, amen? Sometimes it's with land, sometimes it's with descendants, sometimes it's with health, that God blesses us in so many ways. But despite that, we know that through this life, there are going to be difficulties, there are going to be trials, there are going to be tribulations. But the great gift is what? Is that we will be able to dwell in his presence for the rest of eternity, Amen. That is the true great gift. And, but he wants to bless us on this earth so we can be a witness to others so that they can come and also want to serve our same God. Amen? Let's go to, uh, we were at verse number 29. That you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good, which we know that is not true, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast and they ate and drank. Notice again the attitude of Isaac, right? A peacemaker. Amen? And it says in the Beatitudes, what does he say? Blessed, blessed are the peacemakers for they are called children of God. Amen? So it's confirming here the very thing. He's looking for peace. He doesn't want quarrel. He doesn't want an issues. He wants what? He just wants to live in peace. Amen? And so we're seeing by him being faithful, maybe that frustration that I talked about earlier, here is confirmed now these same people that were kicking him out, now they're saying what? We, we want to come in covenant with you. We want to be good neighbors. Amen? Amen? And so they made a feast, verse number 31. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. Amen? The Holy Spirit continues to manifest in the lives of those that are faithful, right? So he called it Sheba, therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. And that city is still standing, right, over, it's part of the nation of Israel. That's the same place where I, with Abraham, right? So we're seeing him following the footsteps of, of, his, of, his, of his father. We're seeing the same blessings. We're seeing a reconfirming of the covenants, of the blessing that God gave Abraham. He's given it to Isaac, and he's going to give it to every single one of us that honor him, love him, and fear him, and follow his ways, Amen. So it's not going to be a little well that we're going to get. Don't think, oh, if I follow the Lord, I'm going to get a well. No. Think about Revelation chapter 22 where it says that the what? That the, the tree of life was on both sides and there was what? There was a river flowing coming from the throne of God. Amen. That's the blessing. It's the, the, the blessing of the presence of God, the refreshing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it finishes with verse number 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Bera the Hittite, and Basmoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And they were grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. So it closes on a sad note. What happened to Esau? Who did he marry? Did he, did he follow God's God's plan? No. Unequal? Unequal yokes, right? And now we see then it became a burden for who? For, for his parents. In the same way when we follow in unequal yokes, it, the Spirit of God, right, is also, he, he, it hurts because he knows what the result is going to be. When we don't follow his plan, God sees, he foresees it, and he knows the pain and suffering that is going to come from us from being literally unfaithful, right? And from being spiritually unfaithful as well. And so this is the reason why I think Esau was not named, uh, not giving the blessings, right? Because God foretold, God already knew from the future what Esau was going to be doing, what his character was going to be like. He was disobeying God. He was disobeying his parents, right? And he did not want to follow in the ways of the Lord. And so that's a good, one of the good uh, explanations of to why he was not chosen amongst a number of other ones. Amen? Yeah. So a lot of blessings here, right? 
Lesson one, the promise, the Messiah, the seed, the lineage was going to continue through Isaac into the end. Number two, the, the blessing through obedience. Amen. That was another lesson. Number three, adversity for those that are faithful. Right? The adversity shall come. When Jesus says, do not fear, right? Even if affliction comes, don't, don't worry. I have been through it and I have overcome that already. I'm going to give you victory. We see also the issue of moving away from the city. We see also that we are to be witnesses to the blessings of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To those that are around us, our neighbors. And, uh, and we see Christ in this story. Amen. Because it's all pointing to Christ and how he also was going to give us that blessing through his witness and his testimony as he was going to be the seed of God. Amen.